Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're going to discuss how to process grief. No, no, no. This is another question from a listener. Again, thank you guys for these. I really appreciate it. This one, this listener feels grief over lost time. From his perspective, he made a bunch of mistakes in the past and he's trying to make up for those mistakes. So when something doesn't work out now, or he feels grief over those mistakes. When something doesn't work out now, he gets, that's, he gets extra frustrated. So let's say he doesn't agree with his wife on something or they see, as this listener puts it, two different realities, something to that effect. He feels extra grief. He feels extra frustration because it's like, oh, come on, I'm trying to get this situation right and I'm also trying to make up for the past. Or when he works with a web designer, it seems like he manages a web designer and tries to communicate with him and he doesn't really get back exactly what he wants from the web designer. It's extra frustrating or anytime he asks for what he wants. It sounds like he's very dependent on the outcome. And he has his issue figured out. He knows what he's doing and he knows that he's getting better. And his question is, but his question is, even though he knows he's getting better, what am I doing wrong? Because I just feel all this grief and frustration. What am I doing wrong? And I'll tell you, I think the short answer to this, it's going to be maybe a longer answer here, but I think the short answer to this is maybe you're not doing anything wrong. You know, what you're telling me here is I have this grief in the past. I have yet to process it. I am processing it. And I can look back on my life, thanks to you know all your great information here, I can look back on my life and see that, yeah, it's getting better like over the past year, the past six months. But it's not where I really want it to be. There's still a bunch of frustration. And maybe you're not doing anything wrong, right? I mean, the, the first point here, I'm, I'm going to have three points. The first point here is... Resistance is normal. I think I've never really made a, a video on that, I don't think, but resistance is normal. Resistance is anxiety. It is resisting. It's anxiety that keeps you from wanting to change, from, to grow. Because what happens when you grow? What happens when you change? You lose things. So our anxiety kind of wants us to hang on to who we are, no matter how uncomfortable it may be. Right? We, may, we may fully be aware that we're not doing the things that we need to do when our resistance comes up. Maybe for some people, they experience resist resistance as like kind of a fugue tune out state. Yeah, I'm just going to tune out of this state because I am anticipating. I am anticipating how I'm going to change and therefore lose a part of who I was. But the point is this resistance, which is the path to the secondary emotional path, something else we talk about here, this resistance and its path to the payoff, it is totally normal. If you were working out, right? if you've been working out for six years and you still get sore after chest day, I mean, I was just thinking, I, I've been doing straight leg deadlifts for like probably 15 years since college. And I just did them the other day. My hamstrings are sore. My lower back is still a little sore. That's good. That means I'm challenging myself. That means I didn't just phone in my straight leg deadlift workout on Tuesday. Very similar to relapse. So this, so drug addiction would be the response to resistance more of the secondary emotional path it's very similar in rehab and uh, relapse and addicts over working through their addictions you know i cut my teeth in this industry working with addicts and alcoholics and what you learn is relapse is part of it so when somebody has a relapse it's almost like you want to celebrate okay good we need to get through about five or six of these according to literature so let's okay so you had the last one three months ago you had okay one recently Let, let's get a few more out here right this is you trying to push against the change that is inevitably happening so good let's get through the frustration i, I mean i think that just having that perspective on it like, like if you didn't know your muscles were going to be sore after you worked out you would freak out oh what's am i dying you would wonder if you're dying and and similarly, we have to be aware when we really want to do the deep work on ourselves, the deep emotional work, and change in a, a fundamental way. It's going to be very simple. We can make it very simple here at Animus, animusempire.com slash schedule. But it's still difficult. And part of the difficulty is experiencing this resistance. The other point I want to make here, and I've done... You know, this is something that's really important. I discuss it in uh, the course, animusempire.com slash course. But the ritual, and, and I've also done podcasts on this. I did one on this maybe like a year ago or so, and it's just like nobody liked it. It, it was terrible. 
and it made a lot of sense to me, but I just don't think I was communicating it that well. I was talking about masculine change and feminine change, but but the point is, is when guys want to change, they, they're very focused on the masculine kind of change, the routine. And that is, in a sense, when you write out, what should I do? What do I need to do the next day? Right? Did you guys do that? Write out your, your to-do list the day before. I don't know. It helps me out. That's a little tip. Not in psychology. little life hack for you. Write out your list the day before. What do I need to do? What would be a good day? What are my tasks? What's my schedule? And that's really important. That's really important to do, but obviously you're not hearing this, that from me first. But what I think is often uh, not emphasized with guys. Okay, so to go back to this listener's uh, scenario, part of his routine would maybe would be talking with his wife um, or part of his routine mindset, excuse me, would be like agreeing with, with his wife, trying to get on the same page as his wife, going a few days without having some kind of disagreement. But I want to emphasize the ritual, and that's what I was trying to do in that, the, the podcast, and it's what I get to in great detail in the course. And the ritual, in a sense, takes you from what you are doing now to what, to what you know you, you could be doing. Right? You, you know what your issue is. You can come do therapy with me. You can know exactly what your issue is. But that doesn't mean you're going to change. I mean, you're much more likely to change. <laughs> you, you have to know. I mean, it's a, a necessary condition, not a sufficient, sufficient condition to change. And most therapists, they can't even get that right. But you can know what you're doing wrong and still not take the action you need to change. Well, what do we do here? Well, this is where the ritual comes in. And this is, in a sense, managing your emotional issue in, in a way that isn't easy, but something that you can do every day. So the question for your routine is, what do I need to do every day? And the question for your ritual is, what can I do? How can I reach out and connect in a way that manages my emotional issue and helps other people at the same time? So part of this routine would be you know, just daily focus on journaling or introspection, like I talk about in my book, the six or whatever, seven steps it is of, of introspection, uh, you know, journaling, uh, meditation, going to therapy, talking through fundamental issues that you need to talk through in therapy, doing it over and over again, what we do in the therapy here. You know, we don't just let you babble on about something that just happened last week. No, there are certain issues we need to talk about to figure out exactly what it is in your psyche, what it is in your unconscious you need to work on. And then something else you need to do is when you're in therapy, yeah, group therapy is an important part of the ritual. You can go to group therapy, especially if it's just, I mean, because of COVID, it's all on Zoom and, and phone meetings now. So you can just dial in. You don't have to say anything. All you can do is listen. That's something you can do. Right? You may not be able to get on the same page as your wife every day, but you know if you go to whatever group is helpful that, that, it, that deals with specifically your issue, and you don't even have to do that. I mean, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Uh, getting distracted as it is um, but yeah just but can you call into a group can you listen on a, on a group you don't have to say anything okay you can do that and you know if you do the, the emotional work in the group or some other kind of therapy you know the issue with the wife which is really a validation issue you're dealing with I need my wife to, my wife to validate me you know the issue with your wife will take care of itself you know right? you know it will because that's the nature of your psychology and then also, once you're in group, once you're talking in group, how do you take how you talk there and talk in real life that way? Be as artless and open and accessible and honest as you can be in group in real life. Talked about that maybe a week ago or so. And then the third part of this is to put emphasis on the stage of adult development where you are. So we don't really talk about the five or whatever, six stages of adult development. There's separation from your parents. There's isolation, you know, working on a career. There's making friends, there's sexual initiation, there's uh, emotional initiation, and then there's generativity. So where are, you? okay, so we're all working on all six stages at the same time, but you know, some guys are just more focused on one stage. Like if you're a single guy and you have friends, you're gonna be uh, probably working on your sexual initiation. I think the best way for that, but uh, you know, really open about this <laughs> is to just, Go talk to girls. Go talk to three girls a day. Be consistent about it. That is you learning how to ex express your sexuality in a seemingly uncomfortable context and doing it in the right way. In a sense, becoming comfortable with who you are in relationship with your sexuality. Maybe if you're living at home, 
and you know you still like that your mom cooks dinner for you even though you're 29 then part of your focus would be on what can you do to connect with your mom in a genuine way right not at the enmeshment way but it, when i say connection here in the context of being enmeshed i mean what do you do to create a, a boundary with your mom you know in a sense what are you expressing or what are you not expressing to your mom that you want to express? What are you hiding from your mom? You know, same thing when you're talking to a girl at the bus stop. What are you not telling her? Oh, you think she looks great and you want to take her out somewhere. Okay, that is becoming comfortable with who you are in the relationship with that girl in the context of that girl on the bus stop. Becoming comfortable with who you are in the context of your mom or dad, whoever you are enmeshed with. And what you do here with these three things, you just create a ritual something that you can do not something you should do not something that you feel like doing after you watch a david goggins uh, uh jocko willing video well, you know that's helpful but that's not psychology not what you feel like doing when you get all psyched up watching inspirational videos on youtube it's what you can do every day just to have this hum of awareness in the back of your mind and of course the head fake here is and i'm bringing this up because i had a question from another client about Russell Brand and I guess he talks about God and I, and I don't really know too much about Russell Brand but he's one of these guys who sounds like he, he had some addiction issue I don't know exactly what it was and he worked through his addiction and part of what he talks about is he needed validation right that's a huge part of the neurotic loop or just neurosis in general I would say today is people are looking for other people for validation and Russell Brand's solution was to create a relationship with God. He doesn't need to be validated by other people and to feel un all insecure when he doesn't get that validation then go use drugs. In his mind, I, I think that's part of what's going on maybe, but not the full picture. He doesn't need that validation anymore. He just creates a relationship with God and that's where he gets his validation from. And I was talking with this client and, he was, and he's an atheist and he's like, well, I, I can't make myself you know, create this relationship with God. You know, I'm, I'm an atheist, right? I, I can't do that. Well, while I think Russell Brand is wrong, philosophically, he is right psychologically. And you do not need to be a theist to create a relationship with a so-called God. What is Russell Brand talking about? What is spirituality? What is religion? What is the religious experience? It's just the connection of disparate parts of your psyche to disparate parts of seemingly disparate parts of the world of other people it's becoming more honest it's becoming more open and from that experience right like like the trinity the father son produces the holy ghost of spirit of the god that union with reality with other people that more accessible artless communication will create this this third thing will come in that we just call the holy ghost in our culture because you know it, it must be this third part of god that comes in and enlivens us that fills us up uh, that fills us up with spirit you can create that experience you don't have to believe in god you don't have to believe in, in some philosophical metaphysical god just a psychological god that you will feel some semblance you know you call it universe whatever people call it spirituality there's a whole bunch of names for it here on the west coast go to sedona they probably have even more names for it you know love understanding whatever it is you, you will create this relationship with that, when you're managing, when you're working through your ritual, when you are constantly staying emotionally connected, regardless of whether your wife responds in a way that you think is, you know, rational, whether you you get what you need from a web designer, whether you get a specific outcome from your own attempt to assert your need to validate yourself. I just finished the Count of Monte Cristo. Um, and it's an interesting, I'm going to talk about it probably in the brazen head, so I don't get too into it now, but a good part of the group, or not, a good part of the book is at the end. So Monte Cristo, you probably know the story. Edmond Dantes goes to the Chateau d'If. He's wrongly in prison, stays there for 14 years. His, you know, his girlfriend marries something else. And he goes back and he gets these guys who put him in prison. He gets back at these guys. It's, it's a story of revenge. It's referenced in V for Vendetta, that very 2006 movie. And... Monte Cristo, Edmond Dantes, he has all, you know, he has the, the treasure of Monte Cristo. He got back at the people who wronged him, but he was still miserable. You know, he did everything that he needed to do, but he was still miserable. And what caused him to really overcome his grief, his misery? First of all, I would say 
there's a great line, I think it's in the last chapter, it's in the last three pages or something, where Maximilian, not Edmond Dantes, um, or of course the Count of Monte Cristo, not, not his real son, but his adoptive son, Maximilian Morel. Maximilian Morel's father helped Edmond Dantes out at some point. It doesn't matter. He, uh, so <laughs> Maximilian Morel is Edmond Dantes' adopted son. And Maximilian says to him, you know, how do you have the supernatural power? It's very strange throughout the book. Uh, Monte Cristo has like kind of a supernatural power to him and he, he seems to act in seemingly supernatural ways, although it's not explicitly supernatural. And Maximilian says, asks him, like, well, where do you get this supernatural power from? And <laughs> Edmund Dante's answer it nearly knocked me over because <laughs> uh, I was thinking about this question and his answer was, or yeah, where do you come from? Where you, so you can harness this supernatural power. And his answer was, I come from planet grief. You know, you're trying to, to work through this grief and get through it, but this frustration, this is exactly what you need. This is the eternal axe to grind. This is how you, this, this is the motivation you need to create an ever more effective relationship psychologically um, with reality. And what happens when you do that, and what happens when Edmund Dantes passed on, so to speak, not only the treasure of Monte Cristo, but all that it represents to Maximilian, that's when. He really overcame his grief. That's when he created a better connection with reality, with the people in his life who were important with him, who were important to him. And that's what happens when you connect. As you almost turn this entire process over to this other thing, you can call it a bunch of different ideas. It, it doesn't matter to me. Psychologically, it doesn't matter. I have my own view of what it is metaphysically. I get into it a little bit in the book, it, it, but it ultimately doesn't matter. I'm explaining it, but I am not explaining it away. It is still vitally important. And we can help you create your own seemingly spiritual relationship with reality here at Animus. AnimusEmpire.com slash schedule. We do free uh, consultations. Maybe we can help, or maybe I can point you in another direction. Well, you know, whatever is going to work best. And I need more questions. So animus at animusempire.com. Thank you guys. Keep those coming. And remember, you're really not going to be effective in the way that you want to be. You're really not going to process grief and emotion until you can really, through ritual, unite the unconscious with the conscious.